All right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Jennifer McGovern, and I am an environmental scientist with the State Water Board. I will be the facilitator for this breakout room today. Uh, thank you all for joining us and taking interest in the Big Valley Band of Pomo Indian story. I just wanted to start by saying that often the role of tribes and their views and concerns are absent from many mainstream environmental justice movements. Um, this invisibility comes in part from lack of information um, as well as about those tribes and their uniqueness, their rights, uh, their special legal status within the US, as well as the forceful, forceful erasure of tribal history within US history. Which is why we are honored and excited to have our guest speakers today, uh, Sarah Ryan and Ron Montez, um, to share their stories uh, the, of the Big Valley Band of Pomo Indians and the EJ challenges that they face. Sarah is the environmental director for Big Valley, as well as the chair of the Cal EPA Tribal Ad Advisory Committee. Ron Montez is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for Big Valley. I want us all to enter this meeting space from a place of cultural humility, which is an attitude of respect towards other cultures and an understanding that learning about other cultures is a lifelong process. In addition to this attitude, I would like participants to, to do a few things. So these will be our meeting agreements. Please listen to understand, use I statements, be disciplined about not making assumptions, make the invisible visible, and be fully present. A few other housekeeping items that we need to go over before we turn it over to our speakers. Please use the chat only when instructed by the presenters. There are a lot of people in this room. I think there are about 100 of us. Um, and so we want to keep that chat down until it's time to actually discuss. Um, any inappropriate or offensive comments will result in immediate removal from the webinar room. When we move to the question and answer portions of the presentation, please use the hand raise function. So if anybody is calling in from a phone, I think you can do that by entering star nine. Okay, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to our guest speakers, Sarah and Ron, and I will go ahead and start sharing my screen. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes. Perfect. Okay, Sarah and Ron, take it away. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to be here uh, to be speaking on this important topic of pollution and prejudice. I'm really glad to be joined here today with the Big Valley Band of Pomo Indians Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and Big Valley Elder Ron Montez. He and I will be, Ron Montez Sr., he and I will be uh, doing these slides together from our respective desktops, and hopefully that will flow smoothly. Um, we will be opening it up to um, chat and questions uh, about midway through. So if you have any that you're thinking about, just kind of log them down and we will just go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so, you know, this slide actually says a lot. Um, not only um, is, is the lake with Mount Kanaktai flanked by pictures of children who are doing things that their parents and their great grandparents did, which is tule boats on the lake um, made from the tule reeds, and that's on the left hand side, and also fishing on the right hand side. But in the center, you see a very green lake, and that is cyanobacteria, which is one of the issues that we're dealing with on Clear Lake, which impacts the tribe and its traditional uses and its people. Next slide, please. Sarah, sure, before you go. Yes. I would like to say mm, on that lake in that picture that you just saw, go back to the first one. Uh, I was raised on this lake and the picture 
that's showing there is near the area I was raised on. I was raised on a rancheria called Elem, but they called it the Sulphur Bank Rancheria in those days. And this is in the 1950s. I was born in 1949. And my childhood was on this lake. And those waters are, I'm well acquainted with them. And those tules, um, that's there now that you can see in these pictures on both sides. They were a great source for um, my growing up. Of, um, we swam through those, we fished through those, we ate those tules. And now to see the picture in the middle, before that picture was available, the lake that I, I knew had no algae. I could see the fish from standing in the water looking down. And I could see them and I would feed them with my hands and they would come around with, I would have little pieces of bread or something in my hand and they'd eat out of my fingers, out of my hands. And I'd drop my head underwater with my eyes open and I could see all the fish and the rocks and the bottom of the lake. And I watched gradually as it changed and now it is this soup that's here, which is, we can't swim in. We can't eat as many fish because of that. And so this is, um, has affected our culture and our history and uh, impacted us in great measure. So I'm just, would like to share as, I, as we go through these slides, a little bit of my history with it. Uh, go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. So the Big Valley people are the Habenapo rock people. And there are some historical pictures there and a current Thule boat festival <laughs> picture. And Ron, have some words about that. Yes, this, the Thule's were so important to our tribe. It's Bago is our name for it, Bago. It means the round tulies. Those tulies we made into boats and fished out of those boats and, and rode around the lake. And we also made homes out of those. Those that tule house to your left there is a uh, it's made out of willow branches that's bent and shaped and then covered with tulies. The tulies were also used in our ceremonies. They were like a dress skirt that we used for our headdresses. Uh, and all, uh, they, there was a, a cap encapsulated the head part and cinched up and there's a bunch of sticks sticking out of it. That was just part of our big head. And then we had a skirt that goes with it. Our tribal people wore those skirts. The women uh, wore skirts made of tulies. That was their clothing. And during the, inside that uh, house there, we had tule mats that we would sleep upon. And the tule was a part of our diet. We ate tules. And during the winter time when it got colder, men would make coverings of those tules and wear them sort of like ponchos and uh, just to keep the rain off. And so tules play a big, important part of our historical lifestyles and uh, and so it's very important to us to have tulies available and uh, the child that you see there in the middle uh, my son was raised in one of those baskets he's now 56 years old I raised all of my uh, children in, the, in a basket like that which is made out of the willow um, sticks and dogwood sticks and and we made our own uh, string out of different types of plants um, this was a normal lifestyle for us so uh, all these things are important to me especially I'm 70 I will be 72 years old and then my history is is here, our Habenapo people, which Habe means rock and Napo means village or people, 
we've been here for 15,000 years around this lake. And so we have a deep, strong tie to everything that's here. And uh, when anything that is uh, out of order, it affects our lives. And so things are desperately affecting us and uh, deeply affecting us and desperately out of order right now because of the condition that has been allowed to consume this water that's so vital to our ceremonies, our lifestyle, everything. I drank this water as my water when I was a young boy. And so this is all very um, personal to me. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Next slide, please. So as Ron mentioned, Clear Lake is life for the people. Its resources have been and continue to be a source of food, habitat, ceremony, play, and income. Ron, any thoughts on that? Um, the drill that that man's using is a Spanish drill. We did it with uh, rocks, sharp rocks, uh, with shells, and, uh, and developed our own currency with shell money, uh, which was very uncommon in those days. We had our own religious systems, our own economical systems, our trading systems, our uh, family units, leaderships in the villages, and uh, our gathering areas around the lake, our hunting areas. All those things was uh, a daily life pursuit for all of our people. Uh, when the Spanish came and uh, started to bring their cattle in and fences and different things came, it, it, it uh, presented tremendous problems for our people. And uh, you can see the men saning there, they're pulling in these big nets for fish. We did that, I did that when I was a kid. And we sat out on the banks of, those, of the lake and all the women would clean the fish and all the kids would be running and grabbing them out of the shoreline and bringing up and it was a community effort community event it was uh, fun for the kids and it was a time of just experiencing our community life together go ahead sarah thank you next slide please So there is a symbiotic relationship between the land and the water and the people of this land, as, as Ron has mentioned. And we're gonna show a few slides of some of those activities before we get into some of the problems of the watershed. Ron, you have any thoughts on that? No, go ahead. Okay, next slide, please. So there are some ways that uh, the tribe takes care of the land. And these are ways that go back many, many, many generations. This picture right here is some cultural burning that uh, tribes are reclaiming um, because of the fire concerns of you know, previous uh, administrations, state administrations, uh, burning was not allowed to happen. Uh, we're all seeing the wisdom of cultural burning now um, that we need to clear out areas. Uh, you're seeing a picture of willow and some dogbane on the right hand side. Um, and this is an area that the tribe has burned. Uh, the, the burning uh, was for more than just to clear areas. It was a way that we handled uh, the different insects that would come in and infest our foods, the nuts and the acorns and the, the different uh, varieties of seeds that we ate. We're also, um, we're competing with mother nature and, the, and the, the bugs that prevail out here and the little animals around. And so these were all um, preservation methods as well as just to clear areas. And so it was important for us to make sure that when we went to these areas that they were tended to correctly so that we could yield the most food value and, uh, and have access to the seeds and the different plants that we use on a daily basis. And so it goes far beyond just uh, 
of burning something. And because of that, um, the areas that are under fire now in California, and there's so many of them, is we were we cannot go on private property and uh, and those gathering places that we have uh, been to for years and years are now private property. And so we cannot go and practice these things for the, our foods. We're denied access to a lot of these places. And so that fuel that continues to grow creates a tremendous problem and we're seeing it now as it catches on fire and then you can't contain it because there's so much of it that has not been removed. And so the fires are just destroying property and uh, trees and our resources continue to be destroyed because of them. Uh, poor management. So anyhow, go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. Next slide, please. This is another example of what Ron's talking about, that uh, in taking care of the plants, that things are more usable for not only food, but other materials. And you can see a, a picture of uh, on the left-hand side of some of the things that are made by um, the, the plants that the, that the tribe and tribes of this area tend to. Coppicing willow is just one of those techniques. Do you have any thoughts on that, Ron? Um, again, you know, our, our people, the Habenipo people, we had no metal. We had no glass in the beginning. All we had was our ingenuity and our need to find something. And so uh, something to cook with. And so we came up with different uh, ways to handle that basket making from the willows and uh, made them so great that they would hold water. We had different uses and different sizes, different styles of uh, baskets. We cooked within those baskets, fill them with water. We would grind our acorns into a mush, into a fine, into a powder and mix it with water, pour that into the basket and uh, heat stones in the fire and pull the stones out with wooden tongs and drop them into this water inside the basket. And that's how we would cook. Acorn mush was a daily meal for it, an everyday meal. We had uh, acorn mush and fish, and then they would make bread out of the acorns as well. That was a daily meal to sustain our ancestors. And uh, by uh, taking care of the willow here, we had ample supply and we knew where we could go and gather them. And they were prepared and ready for uh, more baskets and more other uses that we, uh, we were um, forced with to come up with and uh, develop. So we, we knew how and knew the names of the plants uh, not the names that some people know today, but we knew where they were just by what they looked like. And we used them for remedies, from medicines to uh, utensils, to firewood, to uh, ceremonial dresses, uh, sticks, and uh, clappers there. We just used all that we had access to because there was nothing else for us. And so to see these things, um, not taken care of it really uh, presents a, a hardship, a heart, a hardship to my uh, heart concerning all this stuff. So, go ahead, Sarah. Next slide, please. And another example of taking care of the land, gathering and using materials, as Ron has already mentioned, mm -hmm. and these are bundles of dog bean. All right, next slide. So now we're going to get go a little bit into what is happening in the Clear Lake watershed. And please keep in mind those things that Ron was just talking about, how these are very personal, how these are very current, how these are family practices, community practices, and think about how those practices have been lost 
due to some of these things that um, are listed on this slide. Next slide, please. So this uh, is an exposure pathway, a conceptual exposure pathway for a freshwater harmful algal bloom event. But you can put in the center of this any pollution, any contamination. And I would like you just to look at um, how many different activities might be going on in the lake or in a water body here um, that have to do with cultural uses and, um, and the exposure pathway of that contaminant into um, a, a tribal person who is, who is uh, doing traditional activities. So um, as we have below, uh, there's ingestion of water and ingestion or inhalation of aerosols and particulates as exposures, also dermal exposure, ingestion of plants, ingestion of animals. There are all of these different activities and even more are activities that are happening um, when uh, people are in the water. And pollution can, these uh, tribal exposures to these contaminants can be much more extensive than just recreation, going swimming, being done with it, you know, moving out of, moving out of a location and swimming in the clear area. That's not what can happen when, it, when it's traditional activities. Those happen in a certain time and a certain place. Mm -hmm. And next slide, please. So talking a little bit about cyanotoxins, um, when we think about exposure, we are thinking about these different activities. We have a, um, some uh, hitching, uh, catching of the Clear Lake Hitch on the left-hand side in a creek. Um, that initial uh, picture of the um, harmful algal bloom event and Mount Kanakdai on the lake. And you can see in this particular case, it's a little bit blurry, but the, the um, total microcystins of these four congeners was uh, over 2000 micrograms per liter, um, which is uh, the safe exposures, anything below 0 0.8, according to the state. Um, and we have the Thule boat uh, activity going on on the right-hand side. So there are, there are human exposure that we're very concerned about when it comes to cyanotoxins. Next slide, please. Uh, another source of uh, concern in the Clear Lake watershed for the tribe and for, for multiple tribes is the sulfur make mercury mine, uh, which was operational bet uh, between 1865 and 1957. Uh, on the left hand side, you see a picture of um, uh, mostly current day. Um, and on the right hand side, uh, and, and the corner and the tip of that property is actually the Elam Indian colony where Ron was raised, where Ron grew up and spent some years. Um, mm -hmm. That bright blue lake that is uh, within that left-hand picture is the Herman, Herman um, Impoundment, which is the um, a spring-fed, underground spring-fed um, uh, pit where uh, the mercury mining actually occurred. And it regularly fills up and moves through the mercury tailings into the lake, creating this ongoing source of mercury, which becomes methylized and then is uh, bioaccumulating in the fish, um, which is a huge issue in terms of not only the consumption of the fish, but also for the people living in that area. And you can see on the right hand side how extensive this open pit mining was in terms of um, destroying the land in that area with the with the Elam people living right next door. Ron, some thoughts. Yes. yes. <laughs> I swam in that water there, that blue water changes different colors. It goes from a rust color, a red, and a blue, and a green, uh, never a clear. And that uh, it's caused from all the different chemicals and the different uh, things that are still, that was buried when that was, when that pit is full of water. Uh, there's history of, uh, of our Chinese workers uh, still down in there buried in some of those caves, those tunnels. Um, the, if you look to the left on the, on the bottom, that is the Elam Indian colony. They used to call it the Sulphur Bank Rancheria. That was there before this mine. That was the oldest Pomo village in Lake County. It started from there and the Pomo uh, moved uh, westward and settled around the entire Clear Lake area and over into Sonoma uh, and Mendocino counties 
on over to the coast and I'm down towards uh, the south area of Santa Rosa and that group, uh, the southern areas, and then uh, northward up in uh, to towards Willits. And those areas are all have Pomo people. And Pomo is not uh, our name, we are Habenapo, but all natives are called Hintels. Uh, the archaeologists gave us that name and uh, so everybody, everyone knows us as Pomo. Po in our language means uh, our, our money that we made out of magnesite was mined in a mine and that was made into uh, round cylinders and uh, cut so that they could be like a bead, the size of a bead, they're rolled and shaped. Uh, and they, that was our money, and we called our money pole. Mo means whole in our language. And so it was the where that money or that magnesite came out of that mine, they called it po, and our word for whole, or they called it a mine, is mo. So po mo came out of that. Um, and so that's how we are noticed, not, uh, are uh, called now by the federal government and everyone else that uh, looks towards our native names and so on. On those slag piles, on the white areas right below the, the blue waters was my playground. We slid down those with, with uh, in my younger days with uh, pieces of uh, uh, tin that we'd find for like a roofing and we would slide down those and uh, like crazy kids would do. While I was still alive, that mine was working. So in 1957, I lived on that, on that bottom piece of that property, Elim. I went to school and grade school back then. And we had to walk from there. There were no, there was a dirt road no electricity or no water. We had to walk down to the mine and that's where we would catch a bus to take us into town. And then after school, we'd have to walk back. And so we were walking along that area. Most of my, my youth had stopped and throw uh, rocks in the water every day, pretty much. And, and that whole area was my hunting area, my playground, everything. And now that uh, you can see the picture to the right, what's actually down there, uh, it's scary thought. I have a lot of uh, relatives who have passed away and I uh, attended their funerals who have died from various types of cancer. My brothers, two brothers included. I can't attribute it to that, um, but I can say that it presents a question in my mind if any exposure to that caused any of their suffering and the, the death, the early death. They were both younger than me and had a lot of life to live, but they are no longer here. And uh, one more thought, the bottom of that blue lake and the white looking sand or that slag area, the very edge of that water was the best fishing place for catfish at night. And my cousins and I would go there and build a fire and we'd fish off of that. And we'd catch all kinds of catfish and we'd bring it back to our, to our village and we'd share it with all our relatives and we'd all eat catfish. And it's caught right there underneath all that slag pile. We had no idea about all that. We didn't know anything with it. We, we were just uh, Pomo kids uh, living a life that has been dealt to us to the best of our ability and making fun and having a good time any way that we could as young people. And so uh, now to know all this, it's, it's really, uh, again, it just boggles the mind how we, have, we could be living right next to this and no one shared, no one came and was concerned about our lives or anything to tell us about this and to warn us or to move us or anything until many, many years later, 
when they had to address this issue, they finally started to do some mitigation, which was not well done and still is a problem to this day. And so um, it's sad commentary on how things are done for native people in the United States. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. Next slide, please. So as Ron was saying, generations of people have been impacted and they're gonna to continue to be impacted. Um, this site was listed on the national priorities list as a Superfund site in 1991. None of the operable units have been fully remediated. Um, there's some additional information about arsenic uh, being a, a contaminant of concern um, and, and mining contaminant in the area. And the cleanup levels that have happened in some of the areas where the Elam Indian colony uh, are, uh, th those cleanup levels now been reduced during, during this long extensive process. So previous remediations um, should be redone. There's been a recent health assessment as well. Um, so, you know, this is an ongoing, we're hearing from EPA, it's at least 100 years before uh, fish will have low enough mercury levels to be able to eat at a subsistence consumption level. Well, let's move to the next slide, please. So now we're talking about um, uh, herbicides. Uh, herbicides are used on the lake uh, to, to clear out hydrilla and other uh, aquatic weeds. Um, and uh, to the extent where uh, a risk assessment actually had to be conducted by the um, California Department of Fish and uh, Food and Agriculture, I'm sorry, um, because of the fluoridone levels, that's one of the active ingredients and one of the herbicides that are used, the fluoridone levels that have been found in the tules um, and in the sediment of the lake. Uh, this is a chemical that's supposed to break down after a few weeks. So this is a study that we are involved in uh, back in 2005 or so. Next slide, please. Um, we, you know, every, every effort, every uh, activity that we do, we, you know, the community is involved. And this particular one, uh, uh, Phil McLeod, one of our elders, um, is showing uh, one of our consultants how to eat a tule. Um, and we were reaching out to the tribal community, both at Big Valley and in, around the lake, about their consumption of tules on the lake. Next slide, please. There's also a loss of culturally important species. I'm sorry about the blurriness of that picture, um, but that is a Clear Lake hitch um, some decades ago. Um, and then compared to a fish rescue that happened in, in 2014, I believe, where we were using little nets to try to get the, um, the young hatchlings uh, to a safer location because these creeks are drying up. Next slide, please. So, um, all of these things being said, and there's way more than that in terms of the, the concerns and contaminants of Clear Lake and the Clear Lake watershed, there's a lot that the tribe is doing and that other tribes are doing. So we just wanted to go into that uh, briefly. Uh, and we're really calling this taking back the management of these resources uh, for the people. Okay, next slide, please. Um, we, you know, the tribe does track and document many issues. This is a, uh, through a lot of different ways. Uh, most tribal data is shared of our environmental monitoring programs because we find it to be powerful and useful um, to helping change policy and change management. This is uh, a, um, a map that we did um, some years ago, just about some of the issues that are coming from uh, uh, because of previous poor management issues. Uh, we have le leaking septic tanks from private non-tribal uh, homes that are um, that were um, shoved into one little spot uh, right on the lake. Um, there's invasive species that are everywhere. There's pesticide drift, um, erosion, and loss of native species. So these are just some of the issues, but we do track these and we have programs about each of them. Next slide, please. So um, we are we do review the contaminants for tribal impacts. This is a, a spreadsheet of the cyanotoxin study that we did on the fish that were uh, of tribal importance to look at whether the fish were containing levels above what the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment um, recommends. And we did find, um, well, the, the sports fish 
uh, tissue consumption level is 10 nanograms per gram. Uh, of course, the tribe and tribal people eat more than a sports fish consumption level. You know, there's subsistence consumption of fish going on. Uh, and those levels are um, definitely, uh, the microcystin tissue levels are definitely above that um, subsistence consumption level. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our program is tribal led, it's tribal centric. And here are two spots where you can find our information. Um, it has this program because it's tribal led and tribal centric, uh, meaning that the sites are um, important uh, the, um, uh, to the tribes and, and we're monitoring at times that are important to the tribes. Um, so this has been a, um, a very good program for us to lead. The next slide, please. So there's also in taking back our loss of species, there, there are court cases, uh, there's conservation strategies we're working on. And ultimately, you know, the people are wanting this, this fish to survive and make it through these times. So um, sometimes you have to do these types of things. This uh, court case was just filed um, two days ago with the Center for Biological Diversity. The next slide, please. Thule replanting. So that loss of habitat um, and, and the loss of tulies, as Ron said, are, is, is a keenly important, tri uh, important topic to the tribe. So uh, are people engaged in uh, the replanting efforts, which not only helps with filtering out contaminants that are running from the roads into the lake, but also um, is a source of food and other uses, as Ron mentioned earlier. The next slide, please. We also are installing data loggers. So we've got eyes on the water, so real time and sharing the data with others. So UC Davis uh, uh, got an invite to be on there and, and some of the other local governments. and. Um, and this is really important to us to be able to see what's going on at any moment. Um, and we're always looking for funding to be able to continue that. And this helps make uh, management decisions on, on the lake. And this particular project is about fish kills. Next slide, please. So we are tracking fish kills. We're encouraging the public to sign up for iNaturalist and be a part of our uh, Clear Lake fish kill monitoring project. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like the Ivan things that some communities are doing where uh, people are able to log in where they see uh, dead fish. And um, we partner with the uh, with CDFW to uh, to go do uh, collect the fish uh, if they are requesting that. And um, potentially send it off for uh, analysis. It's usually a dissolved oxygen issue, which is still an issue. Next slide, please. So still a lot more work to do um, to protect our future generations. But um, as, as Ron mentioned, um, there are uh, many things that the tribe is paying attention to and working with others uh, to, to try to, to uh, get back into balance. So if you have any questions, I know we only have a few minutes left. Sorry to rush through those last slides, but please reach out to us if you, uh, afterwards, if you would like um, to, to further talk about these things. So Jennifer, are there any questions for us? Don't see any so far. <clears throat> So if you if you all have questions, if you wouldn't mind turning on your cameras and raising your hand. Um, and until then, Sarah and Ron, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. It's very informative. Um, and I think after this is over, this is recorded. So everybody will have access to the presentation uh, as well as Sarah and Ron's contact information. Ron, since there's a few minutes, um, maybe you can wrap it up. Okay. Uh, I was I recently uh, sat and uh, did an interview concerning our, the hitch problem that we have here, and the hitch, or we call it chai, and uh, it was a, a food source that our ancestors lived on. I mentioned earlier that our daily food was some acorn mush and some fish. The most common fish we had was chai or hitch. And then the, the other fish that we'd fish out of the lakes, but the chai would go up the streams, up to the uh, creeks 
in any water, even a, a flooded uh, farmlands area, they'd be out there flopping around out in these uh, acreages out there next to water. And so as soon as someone came back from town and said, the hitch are running, that was a call to everybody. The whole tribe would jump in their cars or their trucks. The kids are all excited grabbing buckets and we'd drive into town looking at the areas as we approached town where we knew where the creeks were and where the different fields were flooded. And sure enough, the, the chai was out there just jumping all over the place. And uh, we'd pull the car over and we'd just run out there and just catch as many as we can. And it was a community effort. It was a, uh, a lifestyle that I remember. Those are fond memories to me of having fun catching chai. And then we'd bring them back in and we'd clean them and hang them on a, on a clothesline to dry. And after they dried well enough, we'd put them in these big old burlap bags and save them. And that was our food source that we'd pull out whenever we needed some food. We'd either, uh, you can chew on them like jerky. Um, the kids would eat them as they would play during the day. Or if you're out hiking or whatever, um, we'd chew it or you could put it into a, an oven and bake it. And they'd kind of puff up a little bit, but it was a, 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 a food source that we ate year round. Uh, that is gone. There is no more of that taking place. My history and my knowledge of that is with those of my age who experienced it. It doesn't happen to that degree any longer. It happens very uh, small. There aren't that many hitch runs. There aren't that many hitch left. And so the, those things, along with all the others that have affected my life through living on this lake, uh, has made it in, it's kind of in, it's drawn inside of my brain and in my heart that that our life and our lifestyle, uh, it doesn't matter. No one really cares about us. We're not a priority. People don't care if we make it or if our hitch make it. People don't care if our toolies are poisoned and we eat it or we eat more fish than we have to. It is that same colonial idea that has come across time and time again that we are still at the bottom of the list concerning valued as a people and, and there's uh, not more than that I can do except educate and to share my story so I appreciate you listening and if you have any questions I'll be more than happy to talk to you and answer what I can thank you thank you so much Ron just to let everybody know we have restarted the main webinar and there's a link in the chat to rejoin um, so thank you again, Ron. We really appreciate your perspective and as you as well, Sarah. Thank you all. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye.